Throughout the 1940s and 50s, an air navigation route known as the Northwest Staging Route earned the moniker the Alaskan Graveyard. As aircraft flew from Alaska down to the United States and back again, hundreds of crashes occurred as low-time, inexperienced pilots contended with the worst conditions imaginable. We're talking instrument conditions in the mountains with frequent icing. As a result, dozens of emergency airfields were constructed and a robust search and rescue system was put in place due to the sheer number of incidents. When an aircraft went down, rescue personnel typically located it within hours or at worst days. So why, when a Douglas C-54 Skymaster went missing and the combined Royal Canadian Air Force and U.S. Air Force conducted a month-long $9 million search, was Flight 2469 never found? Well, I think I have a pretty good answer, so stay tuned. On January 26, 1950, at 2116 Zulu, or 1216 Alaskan Standard Time, First Lieutenant Kyle E. McMichael, as well as seven other crew members and 36 passengers, departed Ellendorf Air Base in Anchorage, Alaska, destined for Great Falls, Montana, in a C-54 outfitted as a passenger transport. All but two of the passengers on board were aircraft personnel, except for Mrs. Joyce Espy, who was pregnant, and her young son, Victor Espy. Their flight plan, as was customary in this era, was defined by radio beacons known as radio range stations. We'll talk much more in depth about how these work later in the video, but in short, signals sent from these stations formed highways in the air that aircraft would follow. In the case of Air Force 2469, the plan was to follow the Green 8 airway to Northway before turning and following the Amber 2 to Great Falls. If things had gone as planned, the flight should have taken eight and a half hours, but for added safety, the plane carried over 13 hours of fuel. This route, the Amber II, would take the flight down what was known as the Northwest Staging Route, which was created during World War II as an aerial supply line intended to provide the Russians with supplies and equipment to help fight Axis forces on the Eastern Front. On the day in question, flight service stations in the area reported the weather as safe, and ceilings were scattered to clear over most of the route, save for a section near Whitehorse. In that area, there was an overcast layer at 7,500 feet and a possibility of light icing. In small aircraft, reports of icing would be a no-go item, but the C-54 featured numerous anti-icing and de-icing systems we'll discuss later, so for them, this probably wasn't thought to be a deal-breaker. Shortly after the flight departed, they began reporting their fixes as planned. At an initial altitude of 11,000 feet, they made their required reports at Wasilla Intersection before proceeding to Sheep Mountain, then to Gulkana, before turning off the Green 8 airway onto the Amber 2 at Northway. Northway Radio, this is Air Force Flight 2469, reporting over Northway, on 1,000 feet. Expect stack next, 2309 Zulu. All is normal at this time. At Northway, the time was 2251 Zulu, or 151 local time. From that point forward, they began working their way southeast, where they descended to an altitude of 10,000 feet as planned. Interestingly, and perhaps relevant to the fate of Flight 2469, 10,000 feet was the minimum obstacle altitude they could fly on their route, and about the maximum altitude they could fly due to the C-54 being unpressurized. So, nearing dusk in mountainous terrain that would soon be obscured by cloud cover, the flight proceeded without making any reports that would suggest they were experiencing any issues whatsoever. At 2309 Zulu, right on schedule, the crew reported that they were over snag. Snag radio, this is Air Force 2469, reporting over snag, 2309 Zulu at 10,000 feet. At this time, we're experiencing moderate turbulence and heavy icing. Expect Asia next. The next required position report for Air Force 2469 would have been over ASIC, but the flight would never make that report. In fact, tragically, the flight would never be heard from again. Immediately as the Skymaster failed to report, all the stations along the airway were alerted and radio operators ran an extensive communications check until one hour after the flight's reported ETA at Great Falls. At the same time, the Northwest Air Command immediately set up a search center at Whitehorse. From there, the group would coordinate activities between the Royal Canadian Air Force and the U.S. Air Force. 
That night, Lieutenant Colonel Strauss, who had been appointed to head the task force that would search for the lost Skymaster, took off from Ladd Air Force Base in a C-54 and brought along with him another C-47 as they headed for Whitehorse. In addition, he tasked another B-17 from 10th Rescue Squadron to fly to Fort Nelson and investigate reports of flares in the vicinity of Watson Lake. Soon, however, these reports were considered irrelevant as no evidence of a crash or survivors was found at this location. Around the same time, townsfolk reported another alleged explosion about 90 miles east of Whitehorse. Still, nobody could confirm the validity of this rumor, and the official report fails to mention whether rescue forces investigated. The following day, January 27th, the search couldn't continue as snow, low ceilings, and visibility covered most of the area. As such, only the areas between Snag and Whitehorse, and the area around Watson Lake and Fort Nelson, were searched. At this time, the order was given to make all serviceable aircraft not essential to their immediate operational needs available to the 10th Rescue Squadron so they could expand the scope of the search. By nightfall, 25 U.S. Air Force aircraft were out on search missions, with 10 more standing by for takeoff on the morning of the 28th. Soon, troops began flooding Whitehorse and filling up the crew quarters constructed there in preparation for the Sweetbrier exercise scheduled to begin on the 13th. Sweetbriar was a large-scale war game to be set up and conducted to help troops prepare for a potential conflict with the Russian army as the Cold War was now in full swing. On January 28th, the search continued to expand. With weather improving, 68 searching hours were flown by forces out of Fort Nelson, while 44 more were flown from the primary base in Whitehorse. At this point, the Army headquarters constructed in Whitehorse for the upcoming war game was taken over entirely by the search and rescue group. The search graduated into what became known as Operation Mike a moniker coined after the last name of 2469's pilot in command, Lieutenant McMichael. Back at Elmendorf Air Force Base, where 2469 originally departed from, personnel from the 10th Rescue Squadron were now reoccupied with a media frenzy as news agencies began reporting false reports of the discovery of wreckage. The same day, a car mechanic at Carcross also made an interesting report. In fact, the man claimed he heard an aircraft overhead and shortly after a large explosion. When U.S. Air Force personnel cross-checked his report, they found that the sighting was within three minutes of 2469's estimated time over Whitehorse. However, when this report was investigated, the searching aircraft found no signs of the Skymaster or survivors in the area. The following day on January 29th, the weather was perfect for more searching, and the combined Royal Canadian Air Force and U.S. Air Force forces flew 250 combined hours between Elmdorf, Whitehorse, and Fort Nelson, as well as the entire route from Golkana to Fort Nelson and 50 miles on either side of the Amber II airway. Interestingly, the report does not mention any leads or reports during this period. January 30th marked the first of three consecutive days of good flying weather, during which flyers logged 40% of the total flying time involved in Operation Mike. The search efforts focused on the areas considered most probable, which were covered at least twice. That said, the 30th of January was the first time search efforts expanded into the mountain ranges to the south of 2469's route. These areas, specifically the St. Elias and Wrangell Mountains, were covered by the 10th Rescue Squadron's B-17s and two B-29s from Great Falls. The B-17s were conducting visual searches, while the primary mission of the B-29s was to conduct a radio sweep looking for distress signals. The same day, a rescue C-47 crashed due to turbulence encountered while flying over the rugged terrain at a low altitude. Amazingly, there were no fatalities. But after the crash, the pilot command walked six miles through the deep snow to the Alaskan Highway, where he encountered rescue forces and told them about the location of his crash. Shortly after, a rescue force composed of ground force troops originally intended for Operation Sweetbriar were tasked and began making their way to the crash. Interestingly, in the official report, only 20% of the search crews dispatched to the general area of the crashed C-47 could locate the plane even though the aircraft was completely intact without snow cover. Also, interestingly, the survivors of the crash reported that they had continually operated their emergency distress beacon known as the Gibson Girl radio. Yet none of the rescue personnel reported hearing any distress signals whatsoever. By this time, the ongoing search and the unknown fate of Air Force 2469 had become public knowledge. Reports of low-flying aircraft with engine trouble and reports of flares and smoke signals began pouring into offices of nearly all the groups involved in the search. Disappointingly, these reports were investigated, but none led to any tangible evidence. On the 31st of January, search crews conducted an additional 260 combined hours of searching between Whitehorse and Fort Nelson with 43 separate aircraft. This day, searching focused on the area to the northeast of Whitehorse, and it was at this point that rescue forces were beginning to become disheartened. Quote, reports of smoke signals and crashes continued to roll in, each one kindling a spark of hope in the minds of the search controls, only to leave them more disillusioned when further investigation proved fruitless, unquote. 
Around this time, another problem search authorities had to deal with presented itself as the husband of Mrs. Espy, the pregnant woman on the flight, showed up at Elmendorf Air Force Base. According to the report, he was intent on going to Whitehorse to assist in the search. Quote, in these cases, after the officers in charge had given the individuals every possible assurance that the search was being conducted as efficiently and thoroughly as possible, they were given over to the Corps of Chaplains who gave them what comfort they could and prevented them from interfering with the mission, unquote. Simultaneously, search headquarters began receiving reports that ham radio enthusiasts began to pick up distress signals in the area. However, due to the timing, these signals were likely from the crew of the downed C-47 rather than the Skymaster. February 1st marked the last day of what the U.S. Air Force personnel considered, quote, all-out searching in the area. The search team looked for the crash for about 230 hours. They focused their search on the mountains west and northwest of Whitehorse and along the airways east of Watson Lake. At the same time, the group received numerous reports from dreams, Ouija board readings, and other unreliable sources. With that said, some reports still appeared to hold promise. Specifically, the investigation noted receiving SOS signals on the 500 kilocycle frequency near Smith River. These signals, in my mind, hold more credibility because the C-47 survivors were aware that they had been located by this point and as such would have had no reason to continue broadcasting SOS signals. Around the same time, a bus driver named McNabb reported that he was driving through the Haynes Junction area and he repeatedly saw smoke signals across the mountains in the southwest direction. He also claimed that he saw planes searching there, but they never went far enough over the mountains. From that point forward, a nearly constant barrage of distress signals would be detected on various frequencies. Some of them would undoubtedly come from yet another C-47 that would crash on the 7th of February, but after a heroic rescue mission that would pull those individuals off of a 7,000-foot mountain peak, the distress signals were still detected. The flying would gradually be reduced, but was still enough to be considered exhaustive. The search aircraft would repeatedly cover nearly the entire Yukon around the Amber 2 airway multiple times, triple-checking the mountain ranges to the south visually, all the while continuing to run radio sweeps, trying to pinpoint the locations of the constant distress signals. At one point, it became apparent that many of the SOSs were being detected on the 8320 kilocycles channel, yet none of the searching aircraft had direction of finding equipment capable of taking bearings on this frequency. As such, new equipment would be flown in. Other highlights included the Moore's code message, no food, being received on the 8th of February, which was close enough to the second C-47 wreck to perhaps be that group of survivors. However, they'd only been in the wild just one day and so they should have had emergency rations remaining. So where this transmission came from is anybody's guess. As the search grew more desperate, so too did the suggestions given by a public desperate to hear news about the Skymaster's recovery. A quote from the official report. Mr. McCain phones. His back broke several years ago, and his wife had a severe stomachache at the exact time the accident happened. Shortly after that, he was involved in another accident, and his wife had the same pain in the stomach. At precisely 1732 on the 26th of February, she had another pain and suggested that the accident of the C-54 Air Force 2469 was the cause of the peculiar pain. It happens that a dear friend of the family was aboard the aircraft and that there may be a possibility of timing the two incidents together. It was suggested by McCain to plot the aircraft's last position report, which was at 1309, using the ground speed and time to the time his wife had the stomach ache, and perhaps the aircraft could be located." Unquote. Around the same time at the beginning of February, reports of crashes sighted and distress signals from the southern edge of British Columbia would start popping up. Soon, Royal Canadian Air Forces were dispatched there and the possibility that the flight had somehow continued south almost to the continental United States began seeming more plausible. But these leads turned out to be fruitless, like all others, and the forces sent there soon returned with nothing to show for their hard work. As the search for Air Force 2469 progressed, those involved examined each lead closely until around the 14th, when their pursuit was overshadowed by the news of a B-36 crashing off of British Columbia's coast with an inactive Fat Boy atomic bomb. This could not be ignored as it posed a major risk to public safety and demanded attention. Subsequently, the Royal Canadian Air Force diverted its full attention to the B-36's recovery and abandoned its mission to find 2469. Yet, the U.S. Air Force groups left behind continued taking a meeting with a group of Alaska airline pilots in which they proposed that the navigator could have mistakenly tuned in to Yucatan radio rather than ASIC as they intended. If that were to happen, the resulting course would have taken the plane directly into the St. Elias range where the mountain peaks were as high as 19,000 feet. And, as you remember, Air Force 2469 was limited to a 10,000-foot altitude. Although all parties were in agreement, no additional searching took place due to this suggestion since the 10th had already determined that that area was most likely where the impact had happened, but they had already searched it and had failed to find any wreckage. One of the final leads reported in the search was that of an Indian trapper on the 18th of February, 
The man stated that he had seen a fresh landslide near Burwash Landing over which scavenging birds were observed for the past several weeks. In response, eight aircraft with pararescue personnel were sent to investigate the report, but nothing came of it. Shortly after this lead produced nothing, the investigation was officially closed. In the end, it was Whitehorse's disposition that the aircraft was forced down due to icing somewhere between Snag and Fort Nelson. Others in the 10th Rescue Squadron believe the most likely location of the airplane was between Snag and Asiak in the Wrangell Mountain area. The Air Force also believed that the lack of position reports would be from a radio failure due to extreme icing and the pilot would likely land the plane as soon as he could see the ground. And that concluded the official report of the search. It just fizzled out. And now, like me, you're probably asking, why wasn't Air Force 2469 located? Well, I had the same question, so I ratcheted things up a notch. To unravel the mysteries of this incident, I dove deep into aviation history. I read through the entire search report multiple times, thoroughly studied the C-54 pilot operating manual, and learned to fly the plane in a simulator. And to further my search, I recreated the entire northwestern staging route in Google Earth, as well as placed all of the specific reports on the map. Even more, I discovered how to use radio range stations for navigation to simulate the flight even more accurately. And after that, I devoted my time and energy to researching other tragedies within this region to form a better understanding of search and rescue protocol operations. So what am I trying to do with all this? Well, I'm trying to leverage my aviation expertise to comprehensively review all of the available information. Now, while I can't ensure that my inferences here are going to be 100% accurate, because they're merely speculation after all, after this report, I am confident that my theories provide a plausible explanation at the very least for 2469's disappearance. Before I discuss my theory, let's take a second, in true accident investigation fashion, to highlight the limitations of Operation Mike. Because while scope-wise the search was as exhaustive as anyone could ask for, there were some severe limitations. In my mind, the first problem with the investigation was not the fault of the rescue forces themselves, but rather the problem with the weather. Remember, the plane was lost on January 26th, and from that evening and into the next few days, a weather system would sit in the area and prevent proper searching during that critical period. Another confounding issue was the aircraft the search was using. In fact, they even mentioned this in the official report, agreeing that the visibility of the bombers and transport aircraft they employed was less than ideal. Yet, they were the only aircraft available. That said, we can see how much of a factor their poor visibility was by highlighting that only 20% of the search aircraft could even spot the first downed C-47, despite being given its exact location by the pilot. And remember, this wreck had no snow cover and was completely intact. Now imagine how successful they might have been if the wreck, as was suspected in the C-54's case, was in pieces and partially covered with snow. In terms of the radio side of the search, the primary limitation was just the area and the technology itself. Because they were using relatively long wavelengths to transmit distress signals during that time, any transmission on these frequencies would tend to bounce and bend. Due to this flexible propagation, any receiver detecting a transmission couldn't be trusted for reliable directional fixes. And again, the Air Force made a note of this limitation in their report, stating, quote, Too much credence should not be placed on bearings obtained due to mountainous terrain, type of equipment, and the probability of receiving sky waves rather than ground waves, unquote. The other issue was that many of the planes lacked the proper equipment to take directional fixes on one of the highest usable emergency frequencies they had available at the time, 8230. It wouldn't be until after the first week in February when mobile direction finding equipment capable of reading this frequency would be acquired and used by search aircraft. This is critical because fixes on this frequency would have likely been slightly more accurate than those on the lower frequencies. The final radio issue was the general lack of sterility within the frequencies themselves. It was apparent early on that well-minded ham radio enthusiasts in the area were soon interfering with the search due to their constant communications. So with all that in mind, let's finally take a look at what my personal theory is about the fate of Air Force 2469. It's my belief that despite the thorough exploration of the St. Elias and Wrangell ranges, Air Force 2469 ended up in this region due to a range of possible decisions I'll discuss shortly. To highlight why I think this is the case, let's look at General Airways Flight 785. Like Air Force 2469, this General Airways flight flew to the Yukon region in January of 1952. Now, tragically, this flight ended up impacting Mount Krillin due to a navigational error. In a narrative similar to 2469's, after passing over Sitka, headed up the coast, the flight failed to report over Yucatan, and shortly after that, military aircraft were dispatched to search for the missing aircraft. Just as they had two years before, the 10th Air Force Rescue Squadron found themselves over the St. Elias Mountains. And soon, just as before, the weather began making the search difficult. 
However, the following morning, in a stroke of luck, a B-17 aircraft identified the wreckage at 9,000 feet and officially confirmed it was the General Airways flight. Now, I might cover this wreck in more detail in a future video, but the important thing to take away from this wreck is that the following day, another aircraft flew to the scene but couldn't locate the crash site because recent weather had covered the entire wreck in snow and ice. Even more, another flight by an additional aircraft also failed to spot any signs of the wreckage. Taking into account that the conditions were identical during the initial search for 2469, with the 10th Rescue Squadron unable to reach mountain peaks over 7,000 feet until after January 30th, three days since the disappearance of the flight, the reason 2469 was never located looks pretty straightforward. Nature had covered it up. So, if that's the running theory, the question becomes, what would have caused them to venture so far off their course in the first place? Well, I think the first possibility was a simple navigational error. And to explore this possible avenue, I'd like to illustrate just how easy it would be to make this type of error in their situation. But in order to do that, we first need to understand how radio ranges work. In that era, airways were defined by radio range stations, which were low-frequency antenna arrays that emitted radio energy along predetermined courses. These courses would in turn connect and form airway structures. To navigate along an airway, a pilot or navigator would listen to the station, and based on what he heard in Morse code, he would know where he was in relation to the station. Each station had four quadrants, defined by four possible on-course signals. Based on the quadrant a pilot found themselves in, they would either hear a Morse code signal as a dot dash, or an A, or as a dash dot, which was an N. In this way, given a map of the visual layout of the station, a pilot can work out where they are in relation to it. Once they've worked out how to get on the desired course, the A and the N would mesh like gears, forming a solid tone. Also, interestingly and important to remember is that when an aircraft passes directly over a station, it would enter a zone called the Cone of Silence in which no signal could be heard. Then, as they continued on their heading, they would eventually begin tracking the station outbound, as the N and the A would have swapped relative positions. So you might be thinking that sounds a bit confusing, and it definitely can be because you really need a map of the station to remember which quadrants are supposed to be N's or A's. For example, when initially tracking toward a station, the N might mean your left, of course, on the way to it, then after passing it, it would instead indicate that you're right, of course. To make matters worse, this wasn't always true because it simply depended on the course you were tracking at the time. You couldn't, for example, simply remember that N means left until you passed the station, then right, because sometimes N was right until it was left. So again, to accurately know what these signals meant, you needed to refer to the map diagram itself. Also, the complications don't stop there. Due to how these radio range stations were designed, there were also false on-course signals a pilot could potentially encounter. By design, each station had four possible on-course signals, which could be turned by adjusting the strength of the ground antennas. However, only two of these possible courses were usually used to define an airway, while the others might just point off into space, leading nowhere. Or even worse, leading somewhere dangerous, like into the mountains. With that in mind, it isn't hard to imagine that the crew simply entered Snag's Cone of Silence, encountered turbulence or a distraction, and then began tracking the wrong on-course signal southward. This seems even more plausible when you consider that the crew was originally from Texas, and they may not have been familiar with the 32-degree magnetic declination that existed along their course at the time. Furthermore, while we're on the topic of navigation, it's also worth considering what the Alaskan Airlines crew suggested, the idea that the crew somehow inadvertently tuned to Yucatan after passing Snag. Now, because using other lateral radio range stations was a common way to track your progress along a course, it may have been possible for the navigator to momentarily tune up Yucatat and forget to switch back to either Snag or Ashik. If that happened and the pilot began navigating toward that on-course signal and nobody realized the error, McMichael may have been unknowingly flying directly towards the mountains. That said, at least to me, this series of events seems less likely because the identifiers and frequencies for all the stations involved are not similar at all. After passing over Snag, the crew should have proceeded toward Ashik, which had a frequency of 341 and a Morse code identifier of ZK. Snag itself was on the frequency 239 and used the identifier XQ. Yucatat used frequency 332 and an identifier of VY. If you review those Morse code identifiers, I don't believe they're similar enough to warrant any confusion, but nothing's impossible. And while I don't think it's what happened, I can't rule it out. I can, however, offer a much more plausible course of events. As I mentioned, in their last communication to Snag Radio at 4.09 Yukon Standard Time, Air Force 2469 reported that they were encountering ice. And not just any ice, but heavy ice. Now, typically ice would have been no big deal for the crew, as their C-54 was well equipped. Specifically, when we look at the operating manual for the C-54, we can see it was equipped with pitot tube heaters that would protect the airspeed indicators from icing over, 
propeller anti-icing equipment, which used an electronic alcohol pump that coated the props in alcohol to prevent ice accumulation, and wing-mounted pneumatic de-ice boots, which could inflate and knock off any ice accumulating on the wing's leading edge. However, if we look at the icing severity scales used by the U.S. Air Force in 1956, we can see something interesting. The term the crew used to describe the ice they were experiencing, heavy, actually means something very specific. Quote, eventual evasive action is necessary, the aircraft is unable to cope with the icing situation, and extended operation is not possible. Unquote. So from this definition, assuming the crew knew this was what they were communicating at the time, we know that they would soon be taking evasive action. So the question is then, what evasive action did they take and why didn't they communicate what they were doing? As to why we received no further communications from the aircraft, I think it's likely that either A, the communications navigation antennas were so covered in ice that this was impossible, or B, the aircraft impacted terrain and loss of life occurred so suddenly and unexpectedly that communications were never made. I should also say while I'm on the subject of icing that I think it's unlikely that Air Force 2469 stalled due to ice and spun into the ground while remaining on course, as some have suggested. First, continuing to pull back on the yoke until the aircraft stalls due to icing conditions would display a massive misunderstanding about what was occurring with the flight. Usually, when flights encounter excessive icing, performance degrades and the flight begins to drift to lower altitudes rather than doggedly try to hold altitude until a stall occurs. So with that in mind, it's my opinion, given all of the evidence we have, that the flight lost all navigational and communicational capability due to extreme unforecasted icing. It's my belief that they continued far beyond a point in which they had the capability to maintain their altitude, lured into a false sense of security by the Skymaster's anti-ice and de-ice systems, which proved incapable of adequately protecting the aircraft. At that point, forced lower and lower as the performance degraded, they would have needed a place to land. At a midpoint between Snag and Ashik, without navigation, their only hope would have probably been to turn toward the Donjek River and follow either it or the Alaskan Highway to the Burwash Emergency Landing Strip. While in terms of terrain, I think turning back towards Snag was the superior option, I can see someone might argue that Burwash would be easier to navigate too if you didn't have any navigation equipment. It would be as simple as following the river. The problem from that point forward is that they were now playing a game of Russian roulette with this unpredictable, unforecasted weather system. As they began making their way to the south, they would have had to pray that they broke out below the ceilings with enough room to maneuver. If, on the other hand, they didn't, they would simply continue flying blindly until impacting the terrain. And I think that's probably exactly what happened. But to further prove this icing theory, I want to make a couple of additional points. Namely, I think there's a case to be made that Air Force 2469 encountered an insidious form of icing known as SLD icing, or supercooled large droplets. While most icing involves droplets between 10 and 50 microns in diameter, supercooled large droplets are frequently larger than 50 microns. This is a big problem. Particularly because of the droplet's size, the pressure wave ahead of an airfoil fails to push it away. When that happens, part of the droplet immediately freezes and is ultimately removed by the boot. However, the rest of it doesn't freeze until it runs backwards over the wing itself. As this occurs, a ridge begins to build up behind the boots, which significantly reduces the wing's efficiency. In some cases, it reduces it so much that it can lead to an aircraft being unable to maintain altitude, even at full power. So, it's safe to say SLDs are literally the worst type of icing an aircraft can encounter. But how do they form, and what proof do we have that they existed in Air Force 2469's area? Well, SLDs form in two ways, either through a temperature inversion in which snow encounters a band of warm air melts and then encounters colder air beneath it, which turns into large droplets of freezing rain, or SLDs can also form due to a process called collision coalescence, which results in freezing drizzle. Through this process, droplets collide within a cloud and form together into large droplets, essentially by just being smashed together by some outside force, like, for example, updrafts or turbulence caused by nearby mountains. If we take a look at the winds aloft from the official Air Force report, we know that they were strong out of the northeast, and directly to the south of the flight is a massive ridge of mountains, which could surely create some large updrafts in the area. So I think it's safe to say that we have a check for potential collision coalescence. But that's not all. We can also see some evidence of potential warm front passing through the area on the station weather reports. Now, unfortunately, and you can get your tinfoil hats ready now, the weather circuit at all stations around 2309, the exact time of 2469's disappearance, were malfunctioning. However, they were back online at 30 minutes past midnight Zulu, or 80 minutes or so after the flight reported over snack. If we take a look at the temperatures, we can see signs of a warm front in the area. While Northway reports temperatures of just 9 degrees, Snag and Ashik report 16 and 20 degrees respectively. Furthermore, you can also see that at the same time, Whitehorse is reporting a 3,500 foot ceiling and a visibility of 1.5 miles with light snow. So given this information, 
All I can say is that it's possible that a frontal passage caused a temperature inversion of warm air through the area. So what does this all mean? Well, we can't really guarantee anything, but it does show that it was very possible that conditions conducive to SLD existed in the area. Even more, these station weather reports also show that upon an aircraft encountering SLD icing and being forced to descend, the situation would likely get much worse if they proceeded to the east or south as ceilings were getting lower in that direction. While over Northway at 0030 Zulu, the ceilings were 7,500 feet, which was about the same level the flight reported when entering instrument conditions for the very first time, once you look east towards Whitehorse, ceilings drop all the way down to that 3,000 foot figure. Not a good place to be in the mountains. In fact, at 3,000 feet above the ground in that area, nearly every ridge is a potential collision hazard. So that's my two cents. I think the most likely outcome was that the flight encountered SLD icing, lost navigation radios, and ended up descending into terrain toward the south. I think they chose the south because that was probably their closest emergency airfield at the time, and if they had the visibility, the Dajek River or Alaskan Highway would have made a handy navigational aid to Burwash. Again, can I guarantee that happened? No. But I think I've conveyed some compelling points as to why it was the most plausible course of events. However, even with all that said, there's still an elephant in the room, and that's, what do I say about all the smoke and radio distress signals encountered in the search? Well, unfortunately, as tragic as it is to consider, the sheer number of radio distress signals heard, independent of the two C-47s that crashed and their subsequent rescue timelines, lead me to believe that it's likely that some of the 44 passengers aboard 2469 survived an initial crash landing and struggled to survive in the following days. Regarding where the reports were located, I think the most interesting areas are around Mount Martha and Kathleen Peak. I suppose, and this is a stretch, that if the flight had attempted to get to Burwash and overshot it for one reason or another, maybe due to visibility limitations, they could have continued down the highway and eventually crashed in this particular area. Again, this is a stretch, and it's only worth considering because in that area, we have two decent locations of distress signals and two independent smoke signal sightings. Again, it's also difficult to say whether these locations were accurate because of the radio limitations we've already discussed, but at the very least, it's a very noticeable congregation of reports. Also, this location is even more intriguing after viewing the initial Air Force report, which only indicated a distress signal on a 320 bearing somewhere between Juneau and Snag. So on a hunch, I linked up the direction finding equipment in Washington with this particular mountain slope due to the smoke signal sightings there, and lo and behold, the true course turned out to be precisely 320 degrees. Look, it, it could just be a coincidence, but I thought it was interesting enough to include. As far as what I think about the way this experience must have played out for the survivors, I, I don't know. But I struggle to imagine how frustrating it might have been to survive a horrifying plane crash only to watch as countless roaring engines continually fail to spot you. So, I can't say with certainty if we'll ever unearth the wreckage of Air Force 2469, as it's likely frozen in a glacier or hidden beneath mountains of snow close to some isolated peak. And as such, it seems that the location of Air Force 2469 might remain a secret forever. But hopefully, Hopefully my findings have shed light on why its whereabouts remain a mystery and given some insights into the decisions the crew might have made. If you have a different theory or think I've overlooked something, feel free to comment below. Also, I want to give a quick shout out to Electron Volt, the creator of this amazing Microsoft Flight Simulator add-on that incorporates radio ranges into the simulation. Without his help, this video wouldn't have been possible, so thank you. Again, for those who've made it this far, I just want to thank you and tell you about my Patreon. Doing a video this in-depth takes a lot of research and hard work. So if you'd like to help support the channel, head to Patreon and consider subscribing. Included with your membership will be links to all of the official reports and manuals I used to research this video. So if you're like me and interested in diving even deeper into this mystery, that's a great place to start. Once again, thanks for tuning in to Flight Dojo. We'll see you guys next time.